She ironed her skirt. Okay, let's try this one again. She ironed her skirt! Can you compare it now? Yeah. Let's do another example. Oh, it's slippery! Let's do it again. Oh, it's slippery! The floor was quite slippery. But uh, these examples is that you could come, uh, you, you, could, you could listen to them a month from now or a year from now and you'll comprehend it. But it's enough, a single exposure to the, uh, uh, to the actual stimulus uh, uh, when they... Okay. So when you expect something or you know what to look for, uh, you can actually perceive it. So, uh, I will try and convince you that this uh, the institute of expectation can, can be understood in the, in the framework of statistical learning. Uh, do it uh, in a particular very simple and very common uh, task that is known as a delay discrimination task. Uh, I will use it in order to present a computational model of uh, distancia, and then I will talk about the limits of this uh, model and uh, um, what can what what should we and what can we expect from others and what 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 are the things that we uh, uh, what are the caveats of using these uh, uh, these models? So the delayed comparison task this is something people have been doing for I guess more than a century. This is just one pointer. This is just one example. We present uh, uh, this, this experiment. We present the participants with lines of a different length. A line, they see another one, and they have to say which one is longer. You can do these experiments in, uh, uh, in, in animals, in monkeys. So this is a very uh, famous experiment in which the monkey is presented with, with a, a dribble tactile to the, a dribble tactile uh, stimuli and has to, to indicate which one has a higher frequency. And most of the results that we show will concern the auditory delay comparison task in which the subject is presented with two tones and has to say which one is higher. It sounds something like this. Which one is higher? Not very interesting, this, but this is what we do for a living. And so this is the structure of, the, of, of such an experiment. This is how an experiment looks like. Um, so there's the frequency of the first tone the frequency of the second tone, and every point in this graph corresponds to one trial. Okay? So uh, uh, this point corresponds to, I don't know, the first tone with 1400, and the second tone with the frequency of the first tone with 1400 hertz, and the frequency of the second tone was uh, uh, 800 hertz. Now, the more difficult trials are, are trials for which F1 is closer to F2. The two frequencies are similar, so the closer you are to the diagonal, the more difficult the trials are, the further you are from the diagonal, the more easy the trials are. So naively, uh, when you do such an experiment, you expect that there will be more errors in this region, region uh, in which the two frequencies are similar, compared to, I don't know, these regions where the two frequencies are very different. Now, when you look at the data, well, it's, it's, it is sort of true. I mean, there are more, so blue dots correspond to correct trials, red dots to trials in which a participant uh, 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 gave the wrong answer. And uh, there is more red here than there is here. But there's also some, some interesting asymmetry. There are more red dots here than there are red dots here, despite the fact that objectively uh, the trials are, are, are as easy or as difficult, and similarly here, there are more red dots here, and there are, there are more uh, blue dots here, and one can, one can quantify it. And for example, in this region, the subject did something like 90% correct, whereas in this region, it was 60% correct. This region was about 90%, this region was about uh, 60%, 
And, and when, when you quantify the difference in, in, in for example, J, in J and D, well, the, the effect is substantial. Depending exactly how you quantify it, this can be a factor of two, a factor of three, of, of three, or a factor of seven. But, but this, is a substantial, uh, this is a substantial effect. How can we understand it? So one thing that we like to do when, 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 when constructing a, 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 a computational model, mo models of behavior is to try to understand uh, behavior is resulting from 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 some some from, from from optimality principle or from from first principles that explain why this behavior is the optimal behavior. And I'll try to to convince you that that this bias that I presented here to some extent can be understood in uh, this framework. So I'm going to make uh, the following assumptions. So I'm going to the first assumption that I'm going to make is that uh, there is. The, 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 the two tones are represented in the brain, but they are represented in a noisy way. There is noise associated with the presentation, with the representation of the frequencies of the two tones. Uh, the second assumption is that there is more noise in the representation of the first tone than in the representation of the second tone. This is just because uh, uh, in the process of memory, noise is, uh, is added to the uh, representation. A third assumption that I'm going to make is that the, that the participants have access to a, 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 a priori distribution of frequencies used in the experiment, and, and this assumption to some extent makes sense because each participant uh, 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 is, is tested on, on, on hundreds of trials, so they, they can learn the statistical distribution. And uh, the fourth uh, uh, assumption is that they combine the noisy observation or the noisy representations with their prior uh, knowledge of the frequencies in a way that maximizes the number of correct responses. These are the four uh, assumptions. And um, uh, uh, it turns out that with these four assumptions, we can explain the, the observed bias. And I will, I, will, I will not prove it. I will just try to give you some intuition. So, one key assumption that there is more noise in the representation of the, first, of the first frequency than there is in the representation of the second frequency, because we have to memorize the first one, we don't have to memorize the second one. So let's replace it with, with a more, uh, um, uh, uh, with, 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 with a more extreme assumption that actually subjects don't have any memory of the first frequency. They, they uh, uh, for example, due to the fact that the noise is, is infinitely large. Of course, this is not a realistic assumption, but this would give us an intuition to, how, to, to the emergence of the, of, uh, of the problem. So in that case, the optimal thing that the subject can do, it's easy to show that the optimal thing that the subject can do, is to replace the uh, representation of the first frequency with, with the, the prior expectation. So basically, in every trial, for example, in this trial where uh, it's presented with this a, a first frequency and second frequency, not remembering the first frequency, we should replace it with, with the median of the prior distribution. In this case, it is this line. So uh, uh, geometrically speaking, the computation that is optimal in this case would be a, a, a shift of the points towards this uh, uh, vertical line. So if, if you are in, in, in trials that are in this region, moving, contracting to this uh, 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 vertical line will drive the points away from the diagonal, making the, uh, uh, task, make, making the task in this trial easier. In this region, moving in the direction of the diagonal moves you closer, I'm, so, I'm sorry, moving to this uh, vertical line moves you closer to the diagonal, making the, the uh, uh, trial subjectively more difficult, and this can explain uh, uh, why there are many more mistakes in this region than there are in this region, and more mistakes in this region compared to this region. And <coughs> so this was just a, 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 this was just an extreme a, a, an extreme case, but we can come up with the model that optimizes performance, and we can compare human behavior to the behavior of this optimal model, and we can say that at least qualitatively, this optimal model captures uh, 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 the, the, the bias, the fact that there are many more uh, uh, correct responses in this region of the, of the task uh, compared to this region of the task. Yes? Why do you say that 
floor in this gray area it became more far away from the diagonal because then where you are, then if you are here, correct, but if you are in this triangle, then not. Well, I'm, talking, I'm comparing this triangle to this triangle, okay? So in this triangle you move, when you move left, you either move closer to the diagonal or even cross it. Then you'll give you the wrong answer. But, but do you agree that I can actually yeah. increase in this triangle, in the great triangle? This one, yeah. Yeah, okay. just now move to a little bit to the left, okay? Yeah. In below, okay? But you don't move to the, yeah. you don't contract. If I'm coming from here, yeah. actually I'm increasing. No, you, right, but you're increasing the, to give the wrong answer. So let's say that you are on the diagonal, okay, and you move left. You're very close to the diagonal, so the correct answer here was uh, F1 is larger than F2. Okay. You move to this direction, you give the answer F2 is larger than F1. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Okay, so um, this model makes some uh, interesting, perhaps non-trivial prediction. One prediction is, well, the, the asymmetry between F1 and F2 comes from the fact that, we, that there is more noise associated with the representation of F1 than, uh, than there is with the representation of F2. So the larger the noise in the representation of F1, the stronger the bias should be. This is a prediction of this model, and we can, actually you can test it experimentally. And I will show you, um, <clears throat> I will, I will represent it, in, I, will, I will demonstrate it in, in, in this uh, 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 um, delayed comparison, the vibro tactile delayed comparison task in monkeys. So uh, this comes from the experiments of uh, uh, Anulfo Romo. Uh, in this case, the, the number of the pairs of F1 and F2 was, was, uh, uh, was much smaller. And what they did was to, to uh, compute the percent correct for each pair. But, but for presenting it the way that we presented the auditory data, if you compare this performance here to performance here, what, what you find is that monkeys do much better here than here, despite the fact that objectively the task is as uh, difficult. And similarly, they do much better here than they do here, despite the fact that objectively the task is as uh, easy or as difficult. And this is in the case, so, so this is uh, another a, a demonstration of this bias, also known as contraction bias. <clears throat> but the prediction is that if we could somehow add noise to the presentation of F1, the effect should be larger. So <clears throat> in, in the monkey experiments, they did an experiment in which the delay was a, a either three second delay between the two frequencies or either three second or six second. And, and indeed, what we find comparing behavior of, in, with a three second delay and six se uh, second delay is that the bias becomes much stronger. So comparing this region, they do better in the six seconds compared to the three seconds. Here they do worse. Again, here they improve and here they become worse. Uh, um, consistent with, the, with, with this Bayesian interpretation that by adding noise, the bias should should increase. <coughs> we repeated this experiment in, in, a, in a different task, in a visual task, but we will not have time to, uh, to talk about it. I would like to summarize the results so far. So uh, <coughs> what I've shown you is that, that this learning, learning of the prior distribution, incorporating it with, with the noisy observation, has a substantial effect on, on perception. We, we quantified it, we measure it using the contraction bias, this bias in uh, the delayed comparison task. And the next step was to probe a dyslexia using this uh, particular bias. Why dyslexia? Well, what is dyslexia? It's a reading disorder. As I guess all of you know, it affects a, a substantial fraction of the population. It's associated with poor working memory, lower uh, perceptual performance. And one of, one of the hallmarks of, of dyslexia is what's known as the word length effect. The fact that reading time of words uh, increases with the number of letters. I'll show you just one example. So what you see here is reaction time as a function of number of letters, reaction time in, in reading the word. This is a first grade uh, a pupils. Uh, reaction time increases with uh, the num number of letters. But as you become a more proficient, a more expert reader, this dependence almost disappears. This is already second grade, third grade. And this has been interpreted, or can be interpreted, 
by, 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 by stating that when you, start, when you start reading, you read the word letter by letter. But when you become an expert, you already expect what, what word to find. And, and the, the, the computation that you do in reading is rather than reading letter by letter, it is to predict what are the possible words that, that you're going to find and uh, uh, test your prediction. And if this is what you do, you expect that the uh, uh, reaction time will become uh, independent of the number of letters. Dyslexics, like dyslexics however, in, 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 uh, in, in the uh, dependence of reaction time on number of letters, behave like uh, first grade pupils. So, this led us to, 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 uh, uh, to consider the possibility that dyslexia can be understood as an improper incorporation of expectation. And if this is the case, well, we have a task in which we quantified the, the incorporation of expectations in perception. Well, <laughs> the same presentation as, uh, as before. Uh, this is behavior of controls in this uh, delayed comparison auditory task. You see that, that uh, a subject, control subject do much better in this region than they do in this region. They do much better in this region than they do in this region. Again, this is not a small effect. This is a very substantial effect, despite the fact that objectively the task is as uh, uh, trials here are as difficult or as easy as uh, trials here. When we go to dyslexic, we find that the effect, this bias is much smaller. In fact, they do uh, uh, um, they do much worse in this region in which bias, uh, in, in which the incorporation of, of, of expectations uh, uh, improves performance, and actually they do slightly better in this region in which uh, 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 expectations uh, uh, hamper uh, performance. So uh, consistent with, that, with, with this uh, uh, framework, we find that uh, um, uh, these perceptual tasks, uh, 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 results in these perceptual tasks are consistent with the idea that the dyslexics ha have a problem in uh, incorporation uh, prior knowledge and other experiments that I will not have time to tell you about tell us that this is, it has to do with, with, with the formation of the prior distribution or learning the statistical structure of the task. Questions? So, yeah. So, rephrasing your question, uh, can you show learning of prior distribution as in, 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 in a, pro or a progression or increase in the, uh, in, in the magnitude of the bias over trials? Yes. So, I will not answer your question. The, the answer is yes and no. And uh, yes, in the sense, for example, in the monkey experiment, you can look at bias in the the, many, the same monkey does it again and again every day. You find that there's no bias, for example, in the first trial. Performance, the level of performance is the same, but it's, there's no bias in the first trial, and bias increases with trial number. What is surprising, and I will discuss it, or perhaps not surprising, is that the, the, the learning of, of this prior distribution happens very, very fast. And I will, I will, I will go back to this point later. And now, together with, with uh, Erez and Owen, uh, we, have a, um, we, we are using this framework to, 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 in order to think about schizophrenia as a computational deficit. Hopefully, uh, uh, maybe in a year or, or so, Erez will be able to, to, uh, uh, to present this work in, 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 to this form. Now, the, my, my dream, the reason that I'm interested in these things, is, well, I don't understand the language that people use here. I, I, I do better with these things. And my, 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 my hope, my dream is that, well, maybe one day for one of these disorders, we will be able to, to say, OK, this is the computation that is done. And this is a parameter. This is just the one parameter that, 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 that is affected. and, and uh, uh, now we really understand this disorder. Now, this is, of course, extremely, extremely uh, oversimplified. 
And now I would like to spend the last 15 minutes, no, the last eight minutes in discussing the caveats of this approach. And for me, what I see is, 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 is the biggest challenge or the biggest problem in applying this approach is the fact, is, is, is the fact that we are unable to precisely define computations in the control case, for control, without any pathologies. Now, <clears throat> I'll give you an example, and this will go back to your question in a second. So this, was, this is a story that I told you so far. We have controls, they do some computation. This is the Bayesian computation, and a, a, a dyslexics a fail in this computation. But I was not, well, I kind of lied to you. Lied, not in the sense that I showed you any uh, uh, wrong data, but Lied. I lied in the, in the sense that I, I, some of the results I did not show. <clears throat> and what, one thing that we learned, for example, is that, well, in contrast to perhaps what we would have expected from this uh, Bayesian model, we don't learn, we don't, or we, 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 are, we fail in learning all kinds of aspects of the prior distribution. We don't learn the, the correlations, even if we do many, many trials. And that this prior distribution of, of, of that, that we learn is in fact based on a much smaller number of trials than we would have liked or we would have expected. And, and one can explain these results equally well or, or even better using a heuristic model that doesn't take this, that, doesn't, that can be thought of as, as, a, as a poor approximation of the Bayesian uh, uh, computation. And this is a very simple model that basically what it tells us that rather than comparing the, the frequency of the second tone to the frequency of the first tone, what subject do is compare the frequency of the second tone to a linear combination of the frequency of the first tone and some memory trace. And this memory trace is basically a weighted average of a, a previously presented a stimuli. Well, we can now take this model and, and, and see, well, can we compare, use, use this model, which I didn't exactly define in the most precise way because of time, but we, we can take this model and, and, and compare dyslexics to controls using this model. And this model has basically two parameters. One, a measurement of the overall magnitude of noise in, in, uh, in perception. And the second one is what is the weight that is given to the history and this uh, uh, nice line corresponds to the optimal behavior uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the framework of this model. And these, uh, 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 each of these points is an estimation of the two parameters for controls. And these are for dyslexics. And <clears throat> what we find that, again, dyslexics give less weight to the history than expected by, by the uh, internal level of noise. So, so qualitatively, the, the conclusions remain, but we, we have to be cautious in, 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 in the details of, 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 of the, what we argue about the computation that is done. So to summarize these results, um, I presented a model that is based on first principles, Bayesian cooperation of expectation. I use this model to explain behavior, to explain the phenomenon of contraction bias. We have predictions about the effect of noise. These led us to do new experiments, new analysis, and, and these, uh, these experiments are consistent with, with, with this model. And, and we, we, they led us to think about, about the reading disorder as a computational deficit. However, the, this model is not perfect. It fails, for example, in this aspect of, of what can you say about the learning of the prior distribution. And we have a, a, an alternative model that is, is, can be thought of as a heuristic approximation of the Bayesian model. That, that is consistent with the data, actually it's even slightly better in explaining the data, and, and we can also use this model to, to, uh, uh, to think about, about uh, dyslexia. And, and this, this, this leads me to, to a more general thing that I would like to discuss with you, is, is what, what are the models that one can use in studying um, uh, all kinds of, of disorders and, and what, 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 are, what, what are the use? So this is a model that is perhaps the, the most exciting for me scientifically. We have a model that is based on first principles. And then we can 
we, 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 we have a computation, and we nail down this uh, reading disorder as a failure of this very specific uh, uh, computation. However, unfortunately, this model is, is in some sense wrong. There are some aspects of, of behavior that are not inconsistent. We have a more modest, perhaps, model that is better at explaining behavior, that explains aspects of the de delayed comparison task. Still, we can draw some conclusions about, it's also a quantitative model. We can also quantify uh, uh, the parameters of this model and compare dyslexics to, to, um, uh, uh, to controls. But, but it's less clear now how to, to generalize this model to, to very different tasks, unlike this one that is very, that can be easily, uh, that, is, that, is, that is easy to, to uh, uh, generalize. And we can, so these two models are quantitative. We can say something qualitative like dyslexia give less weight to the history of the experiment or to, to, to expectations. Uh, this is uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a more uh, accurate, statement, but in some sense it's very difficult to draw clear predictions. So this is a qualitative model that is perhaps less, even, perhaps less scientific. And well, we, we all know that all models are wrong, but some are useful, and, and it's useful. I'd like to discuss what we, what we gain from these models. So we have the Bayesian model that was based on, on, on first principles. And, and it, it did it provide us with, with, with brain regions that are associated with this bias. And this is something that one can use, uh, uh, this is something that one can use uh, in, in uh, this model. Now, the bottom line is, despite this partial success, I think, that we had with, with the story of dyslexia, we, we have to always to be, to be cautious and remember that, that mapping a disorder to a failure in a very particular computation is, 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 an over, is, is, is at best an oversimplification. Things are, are always much more uh, complicated than that. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the people that contributed this work. The work on, on Bayesian inference in the delayed comparison task started with a student, uh, an MIT student, Payman Shurian. Uh, most of the work that I presented was done uh, um, in, in, in close collaboration with my Rabbi Hissar. Efri Raviv was, was, a joint, was a joint PhD student of my and I. Uh, Sagi uh, uh, was behind uh, the dyslexia work, and, and Ty also contributed to, to, to the dyslexia work. The little uh, monkey data that I showed you was collected in the laboratory of Onulfo Romo and it was analyzed by, by Silvia Tomasi, and it was a postdoc in my lab. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have two uh, first one is, uh, you were saying that uh, actually it's likely uh, give less weight, let's say, to the products to the particular expectation. Yes. Okay. So, uh, um, if there, the data is extremely noisy, You're talking now about reading? You're talking about reading or you're talking about... No, the, the first experience, uh, experiment that you showed, we were saying that they were taking the median of the extremely noisy uh, first frequency. You're talking about this experiment? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, the first one. Uh, the one with the... Uh, uh, the one that, that they were taking the median, which you were showing that... Uh, this was just for a purpose of, of a demonstration of why the Bayesian model works. Okay. So the, the true model says basically that you have a noisy representation of the first frequency, noisy representation of the second frequency, but there is more noise in the representation of the second frequency, so how should you, what's the optimal strategy in, in this case? Yes, if I'm, if I'm extracting the mean of something that I don't really know, it's extremely noisy, how can I know the, I'm sorry, the median, how can I extract the median? Well, the, 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 uh, uh, again, it's not, well, okay, so, so you, argue, you argue about, 
about the, uh, how can you learn a prior distribution when things are noisy. When they're noisy, but they're not extremely noisy, and the distribution of stimuli is much, much wider than the level of noise. So when you talk about the distribution itself, when you learn the distribution itself, the, the level of noise doesn't play a, a, a large role for the parameters used in this, in this, uh, in this experiment. Okay. And another question? Uh, I'm from Orange now. So Orange is, Orange is uh, the Orange Lab. So you know from one about the sensory interpretation and, and the uh, its ability to, uh, let's say, uh, I might experience something if my uh, sensory if it's a real sensory deprivation, I might experience something that is uh, not exist in reality, hallucinations, let's say. So uh, could it be something that is uh, maybe related here? So that, that's, that this is the underlying hypothesis in, 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 uh, in the schizophrenia 